Well, hello, and uh, thank, you for, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, our Being Human event we did at the IHR Library um, at Senate House in London, um, which took place last, well, a year ago now, last November. Um, so it's an event within a library, how we use that space, but also use the interactive uh, elements and our collections, but also the experience of, of working in a library as, as well. Um, so I'm going to look at what we did. I'm going to dr discuss some of the technology and the people we worked with, and then try and quickly draw some, uh, some conclusions about that. Um, so firstly, it was part of the Being Human Festival, um, which has just finished, and if you want to take part in it again, um, this Festival of the Humanities is a national, indeed international event. It lasts for a week or so in November, and there's some pots of cash you can apply for as well, so look out for those, um, those when they're advertised. Um, it's organised by the British Academy, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, um, and orchestrated from the School of Advanced Study at the University of London, uh, where the IHR is as well. So what were our aims? Why were we doing this? Um, well, partly um, because we wanted to. We wanted to see what would happen, um, which was an aim in itself. We wanted to see what happened if we opened up the library and then how people would respond to what was within the, uh, the rooms within the books. Um, but it was also to expand our audience. The IHR has been around for a while, 100 years nearly, um, and a lot of historians have happy memories of it, but we're aware that we need to keep people coming in um, and maybe expand it beyond straightforward historians, but to be more interdisciplinary and to bring a, a wider, younger range of people in, and also the wider general um, public, perhaps a younger public, to come to the many events that take place uh, in the evening at the IHR and at the school. So we wanted to expand, expand our, 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 our brand, I suppose. Um, we wanted to show what research was like as well. It wasn't so much showing our collections, but to try and share what it was like to do research, um, the excitement, uh, maybe even the emotion of historical research, and also the, the contemporary relevance. We wanted to do something that was drawn from history, but um, clearly had, um, again, resonance with, with the current political situation, and it tied into the theme of being human last year, which was hope and fear, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And there was also a sort of an internal reason as well. It was, it was important, I think, for the IHR to play its part within the school and maybe raise its profile within the activities that take place. So those are our, our range, of, range of aims. Um, this was also within the, the context of a fairly modest budget. Um, we managed to apply for some, some money, so we had £1,500 to spend and a certain amount of staff resource, um, which is essentially the library team of about about five full-time people and a postdoctoral researcher, um, the time we could devote to it, uh, along with our other, other normal works. Um, so I'm going to talk now about what we actually did. And Night at the Library, Books of Hope and Fear, was an immersive event, um, an escape game, which um, I guess uh, many people are familiar with. Um, and they, at the time, last year suddenly were hitting sort of the mainstream and there were timeouts and so on would have lots of um, reviews of them um, the crystal maze was back on the telly and so on um, and we didn't realize initially we were coming up with an escape game we wanted to recreate the process of research and set some puzzles in rooms um, and we discovered what we were actually were, were doing was an escape game um, in fact a quest game as aficionados of the, of the genre will will tell us so i'm going to show a short film which will give a sense, hopefully a little bit better than, than me talking about it, of what the experience um, of this event was within the Senate House. So this is a 19, built in the 1940s, designed in the 1930s, the big tall white building next to the British Museum, um, four stories of, of books, of, of a traditional library, um, and this is what we tried to do with it. About two o'clock this morning, a sudden and lamentable fire broke out in the city, beginning not far from Thames Street, near London Bridge, which continues with great violence and has already burned down to the ground many houses thereabout. I've heard about this whole 
name is Thomas Newcomb. I am the King's Printer. Um, so, um, we set up a series of puzzles in a room, and that gives you a flavor of what the three rooms were like with the, the actors. Um, um, and you'll notice some sort of Dutch accent there as well, which is quite important. Um, and each room was framed by an actor. Um, and here's Charles, the, Charles II emerging from our, from our Atlas room, and he presented the, the participants, of which we had three groups going at one time, and two sets of three groups, and about 90 people in all, um, were set there, their first their challenge, their puzzle, um, which related to something to do with their character, something to do with a, a, um, a problem that they had, and these visitors could help them find it. Um, teams had to work together. They didn't necessarily know one another. So here they are, pouring over some clues um, by the candlelight, electric candles, you'd be pleased to know, in the, in the library. Um, they didn't necessarily know one another. We wondered if that was going to be an issue, but actually it was fine. They, they quickly got, to, got into working as a group very, very quickly. Um, we also, as I said, wanted it to be about research, uh, the process of research, of finding things out. Um, so you heard the, the Dutch woman speaking um, earlier, earlier there in the video. Um, the challenge in this room was to try and find where her son had been taken to, and he'd been arrested for being Dutch, and the Dutch were blamed for the fire, um, and we drew out the, 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 um, the um, issues towards immigration that, that's still going on, but was particularly going on at the time as well um, in, in that particular room. Um, but using the books around the room, you could find out by looking at the contemporary sources where her son was taken to, if you, if you caught his name, looked them up, and then that would lead you to the next clue, and so on. Um, and we had a few practices, a few few uh, um, rehearsals, uh, and after speaking to some people, we, we realized we had to set the bar quite high. It was quite a tough set of puzzles, um, and pretty much everybody did it, but that, uh, that's partly to do with the audience. Either they were people who were perhaps more used to libraries than we'd have hoped, or they were escape game aficionados, and they really liked the puzzles to be quite tough. Um, not all of them were that tough, but there were jigsaw puzzles, so, so a lot of 3D things, that tactile, old-school puzzles that people could use. We had some maps jumbled up, printed on these um, wooden uh, jigsaw puzzles, and once the people um, realized that they were jumbled up, they could unjumble them, make the map, notice the differences between the two places, and that led to a, uh, the next clue. Now, being human is also about real research, communicating research, and we were communicating the process of research um, we worked very closely with Stan von Rossum, who's, who's our post-doctoral uh, fellow. He's moving to Brown very soon to be their European cura curator of European books. Um, but he was doing a lot of work on our Dutch holdings. But also, together, we, we were going through the London Gazette, and we noticed that the typeface changed. Um, our, our issues we have out in Egham, um, we brought them down to have a look at them, and the typeface changed as the uh, fire went on, and we realised the poor printer had his typeface and printer, printer uh, melted and burnt, so he had to run and use somebody else's. And it's recorded in the actual physical paper, and so that was one of the clues that the people had to, uh, had to solve. Um, and here you can see us setting up a print room in, um, I think this is the German room. But um, anyway, we had prints um, on, on the paper for paper chase, scanned issues of the London Gazette, but as if the printer here had just uh, uh, set, set the type. That was probably the trickiest room. And here's, um, I don't know if we can hear the sound on this or not. Di mortales, homin homo quid praestat, stult intelligens quid interest. Hoc ad... That's somebody reading Terence, in fact, an American academic who uh, was exploring how Latin was pronounced at, at this time, and he recorded this uh, sound for us. And the sound artist, who was based at uh, Senate House, 
uh, library at the time worked with us to create a series of installations. And if you walked in front of the right book, the sound would start playing. It was either atmospheric or it actually gave you another clue. And if you heard the Latin, that would feed into some other clues and you'd realize that uh, the Book of Terence, which was a paperback and out of place in that room within it, would be a key to unlock this lock here. Um, and there was a story which they would have read to give us this clue about the schoolboy sat watching St. Paul's burn down whilst he read a copy of Terence. So they were slightly esoteric, rather like uh, crossword clues, but most people managed to, to follow them and in so doing learned a little bit about, about the, the Great Fire of London, which I may not have mentioned. The whole thing was set in the Great Fire of London. <laughs> You probably got that um, already. Yes, on the left is a, a real tennis ball, which um, the kind people up at um, uh, North London um, University up there um, made for us in, for, for the real tennis courts. And these are what uh, the uh, Dutch and also the French were blamed, were uh, accused of throwing into windows um, to set fire. And they said there were fireballs, and there, there were accounts we had dotted around. That, and uh, if you found one of those, you found one of these balls within it, there would be a, another paper clue and one thing led to, an, to the other. The final thing I'll mention here is the hourglass and a sense of time is really quite important to keep people, uh, keep people going as it were and give a sense of urgency. We just gave them 10 minutes, made sure it was quite tough, tough to do it. Um, a couple of other things we found were quite fun to use and again this was thinking about um, print and ink and drawing attention to the nature of of what people were, were exploring, but also re referencing heat and fire, was the use of thermochromatic ink. Um, and if you put your thumb on that and rubbed it, um, a clue would, would emerge, and that led to a certain, um, um, well, in there we to open a door, there was a number there that opened one of our padlocks we had lying around in the, in, in, in the, in the reading room that led you into a little kitchen where there was another clue, and so on. Uh, but that was quite fun to play with this thermochromatic ink, and there's all sorts of interesting things like that, which you can muck around with. Um, we also had digital element, elements as well, and this is what, what, sort of where we started with, and these are some eye beacons, which I guess people are familiar with, and they, they just basically blast out a little bit of Bluetooth, um, and Android phones, I think they stopped this now, um, certainly on the iPhone, if you have a Chrome browser, they pick them up, they don't do that automatically now, you have to install a bit of software, but Android phones pick them up, they're used in conferences like this to track where you're going around in exhibitions, or if you walk past some advertising, they say, I don't know, buy, buy, I don't know, whatever, whatever the, the, the thing is selling. Um, but um, we used it to, if you could find your way to it using a, an iPad that we'd set up, which we called the Book Sniffer, that led you to a page to display, another clue on there, and that led you to another book, and within that book was the, the next clue and so on. So it let people feel that they were wandering around, finding things in the library. And it, for us, it was a chance to experiment with the iBeacon technology, which is really easy to, to use, actually, and really has a lot of potential. Um, but it's very hard to get people to use it, so we discovered that actually just giving people the device was the way to do it. Um, we had a lot of help from um, developers and so on, just behind, in their free time, just to show us how what we could do. And the people at Kew Gardens, the team that worked on the Kew Gardens eye beacons, were very helpful on helpful on that. And it gave a certain amount of development expertise for IHR Digital in, in using these things. Um, so I'm almost at the end. Um, social media, we made sure there were hashtags and so on, so you could, you could tweet or ha Instagram um, yourself with King Charles II. Um, who was one of the actors we were able to pay. We worked very closely with um, This and That Productions, a young and cheap, but we paid the, you know, the appropriate rate, but um, they were very keen to sort of really get stuck in and develop scripts and created a really engaging uh, interface, if that's the right word, between the puzzles um, and, and, the, and the, uh, uh, the, the audience. Librarians are on hand to sort of subtly give clues as well, but having actors who really got into the, the role really helped and they also helped to develop the experience and aware of logistics and showmanship and so on. Charles II, of course, was very keen of his, his, his Charles II poodles, and so we had little doggy biscuits lying around the reading room as well, which people kept trampling on, so I don't know what the cleaners made of, made of that. Um, and then this, if you got uh, the three, you got your way through the three different rooms, which ran in a sequence, then you got to the top of Senate House Tower, which was actually quite a prize at night, um, and the bottle of fizz, and the view of St. Paul's, which of course was burnt down and, sort of, and had risen from the, the ashes. So there was a link and Senate House uh, Library, Senate House Tower, for many years was the tallest secular building um, in, in London, equivalent to sort of St. Paul's. So that was a nice prize. And the people who didn't win it were really disappointed. So that just shows how much people, people wanted it. Um, 
Now, I think I have just five minutes left. Um, so what were the lessons learned? Um, you'll notice the director of the festival at the back there that we didn't realize that she was in the winning team, but it just, just, so, just so happened. Um, right. Um, the feedback, again, we, the evaluation was sort of baked into the festival, and that was one of the nice things about working with Being Human. They get the money from the British Academy, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, so their evaluation is very crucial. But that was good. It meant we, we had it um, set up for us, so there were feedback forms and various evaluation criteria which we had to meet, which was very good in terms of us learning about, about the event and what people got from it. Um, and the qualitative feedback was really helpful. It, it really um, encouraged us that people did feel they learned some history, they learned more about the library, they were more aware of the library than they and the school and uh, Senate House than they would have been before. Um, they enjoyed the event, they would have done it again, and so on. Um, three words, um, there's always three sort of um, subjects in any, sort of, in any talk, and these are my vague conclusions. Um, it was nice to be able to foreground research in, in this project, um, research the postdoc Stan had done, the research that we had done to find out about the event, um, and also um, the sense of doing research. Of course, it was, it's not the same as doing a PhD or an MA or, an, or family history research, but it was people doing quite high-level um, historical research using some quite complicated sources, which they managed to do within an allotted time with a little bit of help from librarians, but not too much help. Um, it was very resource intensive, but you could all, we could also learn we could do things sort of on the cheap in a way or, or draw on other people. Um, but resourcing is a real issue in doing this sort of thing. And then finally, it was, it was um, thinking about how we, we ensure that this is relevant and people can sort of see why we were doing it. It wasn't just a fun event. It, it um, was about the library, it was about the festival, and it was about the humanities and about how the past can help us view the, the, the present. Um, um, Rebecca... Uh, Radir or Rydal um, very kindly set the event up with a short talk from her book. So she gave a five minute introduction to the Great Fire, but not just the Great Fire, the, the year itself, the fears of um, Dutch invasion, um, the re religious strife and fears that were, that were there at the time, and so on, which gave people a bit of a context which really helped them um, as, they, as they sort of immerse themselves in this world. We did a bit of research on the history of libraries, what got burnt, what got lost, and so on. Um, we did a, a sort of a blog post about that and uh, found out a bit more about libraries in the, during the Great Fire, and that may lead to a proper bit of research at the end of it. We had some real research as well about what an earth and escape game was. So we spoke to several people, the guy who ran this website, which is probably the, the main reviews and uh, site for, for uh, escape games. He was really helpful, he came, I, I think he enjoyed it, um, and he helped us judge the level that we should pitch it at. Um, we're not the first library or the only library or museum to do this. Um, Cambridge University Library um, and museums um, had, had also experimented with the format and we spoke to the, the museums there um, and they talked about it and other librarians have, have experimented with it as well and a lot in America. And I think you can even get sort of a pack of, of things to do in a, in a smaller library. I mentioned this and that productions. It's really important to work very closely with the, I say the actors, but really the production team. And they brought a lot to the event. Um, we had a shared Dropbox um, and um, Google documents where we worked on a script, the background to the characters, how they, what they would actually say, and what they needed to mention to give people the right clues and so on. Um, a lot of work on flow and logistics as well, but having this in one place and having people really understood the theatrics is really helpful. Um, we plugged into other things that were going on. That's always a good thing to do. So it'd been the Great Fire 350 anniversary, so we got ourselves listed on there. Um, free thinking was tied into the festival as well, and we managed to persuade them to come and do a, uh, a, a late night Radio 3 sort of preview of the, of the event. So we, we reached an audience of 250,000 or, or, or something like that, that, the number of people who listened to Free Thinking, um, as well as which we got to try it out for the first time. Well, we had some internal goes first as well, but try it on punters for the first time. Um, but it's interesting to think about where else you can get this, this stuff out there, and Radio 3 in particular is an interesting way of reaching a wide audience. Local radio, similarly, um, is a good way to reach a wide audience. 
And that's 20 minutes. Thank you.